it was April 8th, 1920, and Yorgos Kintrotas was digging among some Roman ruins on the Greek island of Milos in the Aegean Sea, north of the Sea of Crete. Kintrotas was not an archaeologist. He wasn't digging for treasure. Kintrotas was a peasant who was digging for bricks, because even though those bricks were ancient, he could still use them to build walls on his farm. But that day he found something more than a brick. In fact, he found what would become one of the most famous pieces of art in the world. The story of the armless beauty, the Venus de Milo, and how she became so famous is history that deserves to be remembered. The exact details are somewhat sketchy, as there are various accounts that contradict each other in some details, but the story goes. A French schooner named the Estafette who was docked on Milos. On board was a 23-year-old French naval officer named Olivier Vouchier. Vouchier was interested in Greek history, and so on the visit decided to go to seek Greek artifacts. At the time, there was little protection for antiquities. He took two sailors and a pick and a shovel and was searching for and discovering small finds in a Roman ruin with Mr. Kintrotas working nearby. Vautier noticed that Kintrotas stopped working and was looking at something. Curious, he went to look and saw that the man had uncovered a fine marble statue. Some accounts have Mr. Kintrotas trying to hide the statue, afraid that the Frenchman would take it. Others say that the Frenchman either paid him to dig it up or helped him to dig it up themselves. What they found was a sculpture of a woman. At six foot eight inches tall, it was slightly larger than life. The sculpture was carved from Parian marble, which is a particularly fine-grained, semi-translucent, pure white, and entirely flawless marble that was highly prized by sculptors in the Greek classical era. The statue was in two made pieces, with a nude upper torso and draped lower legs. The two pieces were fitted in a way common of Greek sculpture. Parts of a plinth with a partial inscription and an arm holding an apple were also found nearby. The sculpture had evident damage, but was still recognizable as being of particularly high quality. There are conflicting accounts of exactly where the sculpture was hidden, but it appears to have been in some sort of niche. The exact location of the find is not remembered precisely, although there is a spot marked by a sign on the island. Acquiring the sculpture was not a simple process. Vautier did not try to take the statue from Kintrotas, but did ascertain that he was willing to sell it. Kintrotas reportedly placed it in his goat barn for safekeeping. Vautier had no means to acquire the statue, but passed the word around and it reached another French officer, Jules Dumont Deville. Deville was a classicist and recognized the statue's potential importance, but his ship could not carry a statue that size. Utilizing his connections, Derville contacted the French ambassador to the Ottoman court and convinced him to purchase the statue. But the French nearly missed their chance, as Kintrotas sold the work to a local priest who intended to send it to Constantinople as a gift to a member of the Ottoman court. Derville arrived in time to convince the local governors to sell the sculpture to him. For his efforts, he was both knighted and promoted. It might seem odd that a naval officer received a promotion for acquiring a statue, but you have to understand the story of the Venus de Milo is not just about its ancient origins, but also very much about the politics of the time in which it was discovered. The French had just lost the Napoleonic Wars five years earlier, and they were seeking to regain their standing in Europe. The discovery and display of ancient artifacts was a measure of a, an empire's culture and its reach. And on that count, the French were suffering. Twenty-two years earlier, Napoleon had invaded Egypt and had taken with him on the expedition a number of experts on ancient art. A year later, French soldiers discovered an inscription-covered slab of rare value. The slab was inscribed with a decree written in the time of Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, in three scripts, Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphs, later Egyptian Demotic, and Ancient Greek. The stone, found near the Egyptian port city of Rosetta, was key to deciphering hieroglyphics, and so was of extraordinary archaeological value. It would have been quite a coup for the French prestige. But Napoleon's armies were eventually defeated in Egypt, and despite attempts by the French to retain the find, the British had made the Rosetta Stone a part of their surrender terms. Perhaps the greatest ancient discovery ever made by the French has resided since 1802 in the British Museum. Also in the British Museum are the so-called Elgin Marbles, 
between 1801 and 1812, agents of Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin, removed a number of marble sculptures from the 6th century B.C. Temple of the Parthenon and other locations from the Acropolis of Athens. There was controversy in their acquisition, although Elgin, then the ambassador extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary of his Britannic Majesty to the sublime court of Selim III, Sultan of Turkey, claimed to have had permission to take the works and asserted that he was rescuing pieces that had been damaged in an explosion during the Great Turkish War. In fact, he claims many were being used for building materials or burned for lime. Elgin, however, was unable to produce the original document that was supposed to have given him permission. There are still charges to this day that the works were looted rather than acquired. But such things meant little to empires in the 19th century. The works were heavily degraded, but a burgeoning European interest in classical Greece caused increased interest in them. In 1818, Elgin, eager to settle debts after a costly divorce, sold the marbles to the British Museum, where they reside today. It is rumored that Napoleon offered to buy them at one point, but Elgin refused the offer. And so some of the greatest examples of classical Greek art again resided in the British Museum. And there was the Venus de Medici. The marble sculpture was made in the first century BC. It's a copy of a much earlier bronze made during the Greek classical period. The nude was discovered in Rome in 1566 and was purchased by Fernando de Medici in 1575, thus driving its name. The sculpture is significant in that it represented a change in Greek artistic sensibilities. Previously, the Greeks were famous for naturalistic nude sculptures, but they were sculptures of men, denoting heroism and strength. The original sculpture, representing Venus, or Aphrodite, the ancient Greek goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, and procreation, was seen as a key landmark in the development of Greek art, and the 1st century BC version was the only ancient representation as the original bronze was lost. It was also significant in that it was done in the Praxitelian tradition. That is, it represented the works of Praxiteles, the greatest of the classical Greek sculptors. A sculpture of Venus in the Praxitelian tradition thus represented the Western European ideal of beauty. That was recognized by then General Napoleon Bonaparte when he first saw the sculpture in Florence in 1796. He is reported to have remarked that, should Tuscany and France ever go to war, he would take that Venus de Medici to Paris. In 1800, when France invaded Tuscany during the War of the Second Coalition, Napoleon kept his promise. Despite attempts to prevent Napoleon taking the statue, he finally, having won the war, bought the piece by decree. The Venus de Medici was taken to Paris in 1803 and displayed in the Louvre. That had symbolic significance. At the time in Europe, classical Greece was seen to be the height of human culture, and a sculpture of Aphrodite in the Praxitelian tradition was therefore the objective measure of beauty. And because France owned and was able to display that piece, it meant that France represented beauty herself. That is until 1815, when Napoleon was defeated at Waterloo, and they were forced to give the statue back. And so, its reputation tarnished by Napoleon's defeat, France was, in essence, in need of a really nice piece of art to prove that France still represented beauty. When Monsieur Durville saw the sculpture on Milos, he recognized what a pretty Greek nude meant to France. In saving the sculpture from a Greek priest, he had saved his country's reputation and was made a chevalier in the Legion of Honor in return. Assuming the sculpture must be of Venus, the curators at the Louvre called the piece the Venus de Milo, although coming from the Greek era she would have been known as Aphrodite rather than Venus. The experts could not decide how her arms would have been placed, and so decided to display her with them still missing rather than try to reconstruct them, a choice that seems to have contributed to the sculpture's mystique and made it all the more recognizable. But the assumption was that she was holding an apple, although there is disagreement about whether she was contemplating the apple or just looking off into the distance. The apple represents the mythological judgment of Paris of Troy, who was asked by Zeus to name the most beautiful of the goddesses, Hera, Athena, or Aphrodite. He chose Aphrodite, and in exchange she gave him the love of any mortal woman. He chose Helen of Sparta, and the choice launched the Trojan War. The apple would have had extra meaning on Milos, as the name Milos sounds very like the Greek word for apple, Milan, and apples were portrayed on ancient coinage 
on the island. The politics of the time would have significant ramifications both for art and culture. When the sculpture was received by the Louvre, the scholars quickly decided that the piece of arm and the stella that had been recovered could not have been part of the original piece, and that the sculpture, which had indentations built in to indicate that it had once been adorned with jewelry, could only be a piece from the classical era, and the sculptor must have been Praxiteles himself. The French art world dutifully agreed that the work was greater even than the Venus de Medici, and represented the very ideal of beauty herself. France was restored. The reputation of the piece was driven by a massive propaganda effort, and the sculpture became, and still is today, one of the most popular exhibits in the museum. Today the Venus de Milo is one of the most recognized pieces of sculpture on earth, probably the most recognized piece of ancient Greek sculpture. She's inspired hundreds of other artists, including of course Salvador Dali's famous Venus de Milo with drawers. She is such a major beauty that she used to adorn the seal of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Her fame was well demonstrated when she was sent on loan to Japan in 1964, and a hundred thousand people showed up just to watch her ship arrive. More than one and a half million stood in line to see her on display. And it was all a fraud. When she came to the Louvre, she came with a piece of arm, and immediately the curators at the Louvre said that the arm was more rough-hewn and could not have been a part of the original sculpture, but actually because of the height of the sculpture and the placement of the arm, you wouldn't be able to see it well, and the arm was probably original. It was common for Greek sculptors to put less effort into pieces that couldn't be well inspected. It also came, however, with a base that likewise was determined to not possibly have been part of the original sculpture, partly because the inscription on the base suggested that this sculpture didn't go all the way back to the Greek classical era, but came from the much later Hellenistic period. Today, most art historians agree that based both on the artistry and the inscription of the work, the Venus de Milo was not the 6th century BC work of Praxiteles, but a 1st century BC work of the lesser known Alexandros of Antioch. In fact, many now think the sculpture is not even a sculpture of Aphrodite at all but of Amphrititi, goddess of the sea, and wife of Poseidon. Those original decisions by the curators at the Louvre prevented accurate identification of the sculpture for more than a century, and by the time they were revealed, well, the armless beauty was famous around the world. The Venus de Milo is proof that art is more than just subjective beauty, it is a factor of history and, and politics. More than 2,000 years after she is carved, we find that Art and our concept of beauty itself is not just in what we see, but in how we can reimagine it into what we need it to be. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.